not the one speaking. I had invited my friend to speak. But there is something I started last Sunday but one, and that is how to excel. If you remember, how to excel. And I'm just going to do a quick recap. And we talked about kingdom mysteries. Somebody say kingdom mysteries. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 10 to 13, the, and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So there are mysteries. And these mysteries of the kingdom of heaven have been given to us as the children of God to be able to make it. Look at your neighbor and tell them you're supposed to make it. Tell another one you're meant to make it. And tell another one you've made it by default. And so I gave you two keys. What was the first key? Time was the first kingdom key that we must um, take note of if we are going to succeed. The devil will make sure that you waste time. The devil will make sure that he uh, eats into your time so that you may not be able to fulfill your destiny. So you have to be in charge of time. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And we discovered in Joel chapter 2 that one of the things that God wants to restore to you is time. He says, I will restore to you years that the locust has eaten. The time that the locust has eaten. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, and the great army. God says, I will restore to you time. Amen? And the second key was salvation. That is a structure, a system that you must introduce in your life for you to progress in life. Salvation is very powerful. Salvation gives you an, an age, you know, in life. It's a structure, it's a system that has so many networks within it that will ensure your success. And we looked at Psalms chapter 68 where the Bible says, Blessed be the Lord who daily, somebody shout daily. Is that a shout? Shout daily. daily. Who daily lords, lords us with benefits. The God of our salvation. He lords us. And Psalm 103 mentions all these benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So you must be born again. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you must be born again. And so I want to continue from there and give you number three and number four. Today I'll just give you two. Number three is knowledge. Somebody shout knowledge. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you speak to us today. Touch us and minister to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, ignorance is destructive. In fact, ignorance is very, very destructive. Now, little knowledge is very dangerous. So, little knowledge is dangerous. Ignorance is destructive. So, for you to be safe, for you to excel, then you must acquire knowledge. People are destroyed because of certain things that they don't know. There are certain dimensions of knowledge. If you don't attain, you will suffer. Your life will stagnate. You will retrogress in your field of profession. So ignorance in ministry will wreak havoc. Ignorance in marriage will wreak havoc. That's why you see there are people who are married, but they don't know what marriage is, you know. Because marriage is more than just having a passionate night. It's more than that. You know, I, I was in a meeting somewhere, and somebody, actually it was yesterday, and somebody made a very powerful statement. He said that before you have a passionate moment with a woman, she's very attractive to you. After you have a passionate moment with her, she's no longer attractive to you. So you have to look for other beauties inside of her. Oh, Lord. I've lost the entire church. So it is more than just having a passionate night. You must have knowledge about so many other things. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Come on, are you, are you understanding what I'm talking about? 
So, so, so when you're ignorant about ministry, you will suffer. That's why you see pastors who are ignorant when it comes to ministry. It takes them so many years, you know, because they are just trying to use the little knowledge that they have to try and build a mega church. And it becomes very difficult for them to do that. One of the things I remember I always tell pastors is get as much knowledge as possible. It will give you an edge. Because most of them ask me, oh, tell us, you know, why are we, why are you doing very well? Why are you moving very fast? I mean, in less than, you know, 15 or whatever years, you have already acquired land for the church. I, 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 I just tell them, expose yourself to relevant knowledge. Explore. Because there are things which don't answer to prayer, they answer to knowledge. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying today. But as we want to pray for everything, if, 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 if I send you to my car and you don't have the key, even if you pray, you will not open it. You can pray all you want. Outside the car, you will pray. Open the door, open the door, open the door. In the name of Jesus, open the door. In the, it will never open for you. But if I give you the key, you don't even need to pray. You just press a button and the doors will be open. So not everything answers to prayer. There are things that answer to knowledge. That's why the Bible says my people are destroyed. Not for lack of prayer. They are praying in ignorance. Praying passionately. But there are things they don't know. So you have to know certain things for you to be able to advance in life. So tell your neighbor knowledge is good for you. Tell them again knowledge is good for you. I've even realized people who are disloyal in church, if you check their level of knowledge, you'll be surprised. Most disloyal people are very ignorant. Are you quiet because you're one of them or what? <laughs> Most people who are proud is because they have little knowledge. They don't understand certain things. They cannot see far. You see what knowledge does? Knowledge is like being in a room with many windows. When you're ignorant, you are in a big room with no window. So all you know is confined with the walls of that room. But knowledge is being in a room with many windows. So that means you can see beyond the wall. You can see far. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So knowledge is very good. When you're knowledgeable in marriage as a, as a man, you will love your wife. When you're knowledgeable in business, there are certain structures you put in your business to ensure that your business outlives you. When you're knowledgeable in parenting, I'm telling you, you will raise up great kids. When you're knowledgeable in ministry, I'm telling you, you will do fantastic things. Knowledge is very, very important if you're going to excel in life. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. This is Paul speaking, and he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent, that means rude and arrogant, man, but I obtained mercy because I did ignorantly in unbelief. He was zealous, but in ignorance. And because of ignorance, he was fighting the very institution he was supposed to work for. Paul was persecuting Christians. He was responsible for the death of Stephen. He persecuted Christians. He forced Christians to move from one city to another. He put them in jail. And he was doing this out of ignorance. He was fighting the very institution he was supposed to work for. He was fighting the very God he was supposed to work for. That's why when Jesus knocked him from his limousine and he fell, you know, Jesus was asking him, why are you fighting me? Why are you kicking against the pricks? In other words, why are you fighting me? You're supposed to be on my side. So ignorance can make you fight something that you're supposed to be part of. And that's why it's important for you to have knowledge. Zeal is not enough. In fact, zeal without Knowledge can be catastrophic. You need knowledge because knowledge will position you for success. That's why, you see, people who have gone to school, there is a certain way they think than people who have not gone to school. Ask your neighbor, have you gone to school? Please, why are you not talking to your neighbor this morning? What's going on? Turn to your neighbor and ask them, have you gone to school? 
and ask them, how far did you reach? How far did you go? What I am telling you is true. People who have gone, I've even realized, look, I, I, I'm an employer, and I've realized that when you employ somebody who has gone to school, that person even works differently. He works differently. But when you employ somebody who has not gone to school, I'm telling you, you will tell them to do everything. When you don't show up, they do nothing. They wait until you come. But somebody who has gone to school, there's something that has happened to their brain. There's something that has happened to their mind. Their thinking is totally different. They are proactive. They are thinkers. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So, one more time, just ask your neighbor, have you, have you, have you, have you, have you gone to school? I, I just need to know, have you gone to school? Have, have you graduated? What have you graduated in? If your neighbor is not talking to you, tell them there is a problem here. There's a very big problem here. Knowledge is important. It's very important. Knowledge is very, very key. Because with knowledge, you'll be able to survive. With knowledge, you'll be able to overcome several challenges that come your way. So say with me, say this with me, ignorance is deadly. Shout it louder. Ignorance is deadly. Shout it like three times. Two. Three. So tell your neighbor, please don't be ignorant. You have to study. You have to read. You have to acquire knowledge. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You have to read, you have to study, you have to acquire knowledge because ignorance is very, very dangerous. You know, I'm planning to, en uh, to enroll um, for a course. You know, there's a short course I'm, I'm supposed to do um, on how to rehabilitate people who have been in drug addiction. And so I'm going to apply, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to apply different, I have, I have different ways of approaching it. There's a short course that NACADA, you know, is running. I'm going to apply for it as well and do it. It's a short course. I'm going to do it very quickly and finish. And then after that, I'm going to apply uh, for the course in the university and do it for a year or so. You know, because when I started working with the young people, I realized that I need to help the young people, you know, uh, deal with addictions and overcome addictions. But you see, it's not only for young people because a lot of us are also struggling. Ask your neighbor, have you fully recovered? <laughs> Please, if your neighbor is not talking to you, tell them there is a problem here. Ask your neighbor, have you fully recovered? What did your neighbor say? He said yes. Was the yes strong or it was weak? So there is a spiritual aspect, but also knowledge is good. I want to understand what keeps them, you know, bound in drugs. And there are many things that you can be addicted to. So I just want to start, so as I work with young people, I can be able to help them to overcome addictions. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And also help some of you here <laughs> who have not fully recovered, you know, to come out of addiction. So knowledge is powerful. Tell your neighbor, knowledge is powerful. So Paul destroyed the church simply because he was ignorant. He was zealous, he was passionate, but he destroyed the very institution that he was supposed to be part of. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13, the Bible says, Therefore my people have gone into captivity. Why have they gone into captivity? Because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished. That means they're extremely hungry and their multitude dried up with thirst. Because of ignorance, God's people ended up in captivity. Captivity is the function of ignorance. Any area in your life that you're not knowledgeable, you are a captive in that area. You are a slave in that area. Do you realize why many of us are struggling financially. Can I tell you why? Yesterday I was having a discussion with another pastor and, and, and I, told, I, told, I told that pastor one thing I've discovered even about our education system from nursery to class one, class two, class three, class four, class five, class six, class seven, class eight. You graduate, you get an A. 
We celebrate you. We lift you up. We put things around your neck. But look, one thing you've not been taught is how to manage and use money. Form one, form two, form three, form four. You leave high school with no skills on how to acquire money and how to manage money. True or false? No wonder we are struggling. They teach you everything. They teach you biology. They will draw all the figures. <laughs> they will teach you physics. They will teach you chemistry, chemical reaction. But money. But money. And you can see, it is a very dangerous thing. I think we need to start teaching money from nursery school. So that when you grow up, you know that money has a way of working and you have to work it so that you start have money, having money in your pocket. So when you come to church and we start teaching you about money, you can say it's a struggle. And you're very emotive about it because you don't have it. <laughs> Am I saying the truth? You're very emotive about it. When the pastor asks for an offering, you are angry. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. <laughs> you are very angry. Do you know why you are angry? Because for the first time in your entire life, somebody is teaching you about money, but when you put your hand in your pocket, <laughs> and so you are mad, and you are angry. That's why many of us are stingy when you get a little of it. Because you've stayed almost your entire life without it. Tithe Vitugan. It's my money. I have worked for it. I have fought. I have worked for it. It's because you've not been taught all these principles. And so you are a slave in that area. You become a captive in the area of finances because you have very little knowledge about it. One thing we've started doing, my wife and I, is to teach our children about money. Yes. Asaf, we have employed Asaf in our house. Because I used to give him handouts. And when I give him handouts, I look at the way he's spending the handouts. And I'm like, really? He said, now you're going to work. If you want money, work. So the other day, you know, he was given his salary. <laughs> so I asked him, so are you going to buy this and these the things that he used to buy when I used to give him handouts? So he said, hey, 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 dad. Hmm. This money, I've worked for it. <laughs> This one, I cannot buy those useless things I used to buy. This one, I'm very careful. Ashley is running her own business right now. Yeah. Her own business. And she makes money. One time, you know, uh, she wanted to go somewhere. And I told her, you know now, you know, I mean, you, you're making your own money, so pay for your own Uber. She said, Dad, every coin that I earn has been budgeted for. So I don't want to mess up my budget. Secondly, I'm still your child. <laughs> so do the father thing. What is the father thing? <laughs> it's to provide. I say, okay, oops, okay. How much is the Uber? <laughs> I'll pay for you. Start teaching them early. Me, when I was growing up, look, when I was growing up, and look, I'm, I'm not saying this to disrespect, to disrespect my relatives, but when I was growing up, I remember an uncle could come, visit us, after visiting us, you know, the uncle is like, you know, told to give us advice. So we were, we were okay, sit down, the uncle wants to talk to you. The first thing the uncle says, you people, don't move close to money. Money will destroy you. <laughs> So me, I grew up when I see money this direction. 
I go a different direction. But now I've realized it was a wrong kind of teaching. Money is not bad. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. But money is not bad. Money is very good. If you're balanced and you have a lot of money, I'm telling you, you will believe what I'm telling you. Money is very good. You eat what you want. You wear what you want. You drive what you want. If you wake up and say, I want to go to Cape Town and relax, you just go. Money is good. Money is not bad. So don't tell your, your children money is bad. Just tell them how to spend money and how to acquire money because money is good. But because we are not given that knowledge, we have suffered. You have suffered. I know you have suffered. I can see it on your face. You have suffered. <laughs> tell your neighbor it's true what pastor is saying. It's true. You have suffered until when you see a rich person, you don't have very nice thoughts. What do you say? Huh? Please talk to me. What do you say when you see a rich person? Wash, wash. He's selling drugs. Huh? Illuminati. They are not going to heaven. These people are not going to heaven. Is because of ignorance. Abraham, one of the richest guys, was in heaven. Now you're quiet. Hmm? But even Lazarus, the poorest man, was in heaven. So choose. You want to go to heaven poor? I wish I had a witness in this house. Do you want to go to heaven poor? Or do you want to go to heaven rich? made it to heaven. But one made it to heaven, rich. Another one made it to heaven, poor. Tell your neighbor, choose how you want to go. <laughs> so read. Acquire knowledge. Study. Expand your mind. Stretch your thinking prowess so that you are knowledgeable in your area of profession. Let's look at the life of Isaac. Are you getting blessed? The life of Isaac. Isaac was the covenant child of Abraham. And this guy had a head start. His father was a carrier of blessings. But there is something that we see in the life of Isaac. More than just him, you know, being a child of a rich, rich guy. Isaac was also very knowledgeable. He didn't just, you know, make it because he inherited blessings from his father. But he did so because he also had vast knowledge. Genesis chapter 26. I want us to go there quickly. Genesis chapter number 26 from verse number 17. Genesis um, 26. If you're there, you say, Amen. There was famine in the land. People were dying. Crops were not doing well. Animals were dying. But... We are seeing that Isaac, in the middle of famine, he was still doing very well. And we will see why he was doing very, very well. Verse 17, the Bible says, Then Isaac, can we read together? Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his stand in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. Remember, there is famine. Read from verse 1, you will see at your own time. There was famine. And then it was very tight in the world. And see, this guy moves. And then he goes to this place. And then what did Isaac do? And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. So you can see that this guy knows something that people don't know. The very thing that the Philistines covered is the very thing that Isaac goes to an earth. That means he knows something. He knows something that the Philistines don't know. Can we keep on reading? Are you with me, somebody? Then verse 19, and also Isaac's servants... 
All right? Dug, are you still reading with me? Dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. There is farming, but there is water. All you need is knowledge. And where to dig for you to get the water. Let's continue reading the story. It's a powerful story. But the herdsman of Girar, Majelo, huh? quarreled with Isaac's herdsman, saying, the water is ours. Now, when the well was not functioning, it was not theirs. But when water started flowing, they now say it is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac because they quarreled with him. Verse 21. Are you still with me, somebody? Please don't, don't, don't lose this story because we, we, we are going deeper in this. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called. You left me to read alone. I came many hearts. Huh? Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. Verse 22. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Hmm. Now, there are several things I want us to see here. Maybe we can look at verse, verse 23 before I, I share with you what I want to dig deeper from this uh, text here. There's something I want us to see. Then he went from there to Bathsheba, verse 24. Quickly, quickly, quickly. DJ. And the Lord appeared to him and same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my sake, Abraham's sake. In the middle of a famine, God is appearing to him and God is speaking to him. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. These guys were specialists in discovering wells. Uh -huh. Then Abimelech came to him from Girar with Ahuza, one of his friends, and Pikol, the commander of his army, verse 27. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? Verse 28. But they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. Is that verse 29? That you will do us no harm since we have not touched you, and since we have done nothing to you but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Mm. You can continue reading, continue, continue, but there are several things I want us to see here as it relates to knowledge. Isaac was a knowledgeable guy. As much as he came from a rich family. Look, if you're here and you're a rich parent, there are certain things if you don't instill in your children, no matter the amount of inheritance you're going to give them, they will waste it. Am I speaking to parents in this house today? You must put some, you see some of us, the reason why we are making it is because it was tough when we were growing up. And so the harshness of the reality of life developed something inside of us. And we began to be fighters. You know, I've given you this story before that when I was growing up, I looked around, I looked at my uncles, I looked at most of my relatives, and I realized that there was a problem. None had made it. I mean, we used to have, you know, these meetings, we were coming together, and you could count cars in our family, one or two. And it's a big family. My grandfather had almost 10 children. So I have almost 10 uncles and aunties from my father's side. And they're not doing well. They're not doing well at all. You know, it's my mother's side that people look like they were at least making it. And I said, I'm making a decision today that I will do well. 
I will not be like my uncles. I will do well. I will do well. I will go further than what my father has acquired. I will have more than what he has acquired. I will do more than what he has done. I will travel to countries. Yes, I made up a decision. I said, things have to change. So even if you are rich, I want you to instill some things in your children. Make them fighters. Make them knowledgeable. Make them have endurance inside of them. Make them be tough cookies that no matter what happens, they will fight until the end. But if you keep on just giving them everything, giving them everything, giving them everything, giving, and then they get employed. The boss tells you, before you get anything you work, they start crying. Because there's something that you have not developed within them. That's why I love Isaac. His father was rich, but Isaac also, his brain was sharp. He was knowledgeable. He had acquired knowledge. No wonder he could even study history to know where the wells were. And he went and he built or he redug those wells. That is knowledge. That was not guesswork. That was knowledge. And those days they didn't have all these equipments that we have to determine where water was. I remember when I started, uh, when we came here, I wanted to sink a borehole here. And so guys had to come to this place and look around. And they pointed at places I did not even want. That's the place they point. They say, here is where water is. I said, no, me, I want it here. I said, no, there there is no water. Here. This is where water is. This is where we shall drill the borehole. Those days, they didn't have those equipments. So it boils down to one thing, that Isaac was a knowledgeable fellow. Ask your neighbor one more time. Have you gone to school? How far did you go? And ladies, school is not for only men. Some of you ladies have very wrong notion. You know me, I don't want to go to school and study very fast. I'm just waiting for my gentleman. He's studying. He's sitting for exams. You know, he's doing, let him pass with fly colors, get a job. Me, my work is just to paint my lips and my fingertips. And then he will find me and deliver me from poverty. Who told you we want foolish women and ignorant women? We also want women whose brains are refined. When you sit on the table, you can have an intelligent conversation. Touch a lady next to you and tell her, please, go to school. <laughs> Cooking, knowing how to cook ugali is not enough. What is your qualification? I can make ugali for 15 villagers. That is not enough. Be knowledgeable. Am I talking to somebody here? Everybody, be knowledgeable. Isaac was a knowledgeable guy. He read, he studied, he had history at his fingertips, and he understood that these are the wells that were dug by my father Abraham. And so, several things that I want you to see from this story. Number one, Isaac knew places of opportunities. Isaac new places of opportunity. There was famine in the land, but he knew places. Somebody say places. He knew the right location for opportunities. He knew the right, he, he knew the right spot for opportunities. He knew the sweet spot where water was flowing because of knowledge. My goodness. That's why he went and dwelt in the valley of Gerar. Then later on, he went to Bathsheba. Then later on, he went to Rehoboth. Because of knowledge, Hazak had the ability to recognize places of opportunity in the midst of scarcity. Because I want you to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. Even if things are tight, out of the tightness, there is an opportunity. Even if things are thick, out of the thickness, there is an opportunity. Even if there is famine and it's not raining, in the midst of scarcity, there is an opportunity. Do you understand what I'm talking about? During the pandemic and the lockdown, while we were crying, people have lost jobs. Some people are celebrating because that is the time they made a killing. In fact, they, are wish they were wishing the lockdown was extended. Verse 18, the Bible says, he dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father. 
The Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. But him, you know, he came to this place and he knew these are the wells and he dug them. He knew those were the places of great opportunity. He knew the history of that location. He knew the history of those places. He knew that those places had what we call ancient wells. And these wells were not dry. They were just covered up. And because of his knowledge, you know, he just came and redug these wells. And when he was done digging these wells, water started flowing. Ladies and gentlemen, when you acquire knowledge, you will have extraordinary instincts. Ooh, beautiful. I say when you acquire knowledge, you will have extraordinary, place, uh, extraordinary instincts. And these are the instincts that will help you to see places of opportunities. People will walk in places and they will just see this is an ordinary place. But you, because you have knowledge, you will be seeing something extra about that particular place. Sometimes people will even tell you, why are you buying this land? Why are you settling here? Why are you doing this here? Why are you establishing your business here? Why are you doing this? Why are you moving to this particular place? Because they don't understand. But because you, you have knowledge, you have extraordinary instincts that tell you that as you move to this place in the next two years or three years or four years, this will be a prime land. Hallelujah. I pray over you. May you have extraordinary instincts. Because of knowledge, may you have extraordinary instincts. May you go to places that people despise, but after a week, they wish they followed you. May you buy land in places that people despise, but after a year, you will be the one laughing and celebrating because of knowledge. Isaac knew places of opportunities. As you study, your eyes will be open. As you read, your eyes will be open. I'm telling you. And what people see as ordinary, you will look at it and you will start seeing there is potential in this thing. There is potential in this thing. This is the next big thing that is going to hit this nation. Wow. This place, this place, this place. Like there's a place somebody took me, you know, uh, after, after, actually we went as a group as men. And I was standing on that ground and I said, this place, I must get land here. Because I started looking at the place in the next five years. And I said, you will come here trying to get land, you'll never find it. Because if the government can transport 3,000 people every day to that location, to build the city in that location, that must be very serious. But you will come, if you don't have knowledge, say, Ay, ata hakuna lami, hakuna stima, hakuna maji, hakuna miti. Nini ingine unataka? But knowledge tells you, this is now. But see, in the next two years, in the next three years, there will be a well in this place. Water will be flowing in this place. There will be lighting at night in this place. I wish I had a witness in this house. There will be a supermarket here. Yes, there will be tarmac roads in this place. Knowledge tells you that this is a place of opportunities. That's why you have to expose your head. To knowledge. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I said, do you understand what I'm talking about? Knowledge tells you that you can't just live in this one bedroom house, even though it is very, very comfortable for you. Or single room because it's very comfortable for you. Step out. Go to the outskirts of the city. Walk around and see what is happening. How people are building. One day, when we started the church, another lady took me somewhere. I don't like mentioning that place because it reminds me of my pain. And we drove and we went. And she told me, Pastor, I've bought land here. I want you to buy land. This place looks like it's going to develop very fast. I said, oh, yeah, 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 it looks. But inside, I, was, I had already despised the place because I looked at the kilometers we covered going to that place. I was like, nah. I was telling Pastor Mary, really? Mm, nah. Anyway, let's just go. Eh, we're going. Eh, we're going. Eh. The more we were moving away from the city, the more I was making a decision that whatever I see, I shall not buy into it. Hmm. 
Then we got there. Then she's so excited. She was passionate. She said, Pastor, look, 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 look. Me, I'm saying, what? <laughs> what? All I'm seeing is shrubs. I said, just look, look, look. This, this is the next place that people are moving to. I said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, but in my heart, I'd already blocked my heart, blocked my mind. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were very cheap at that particular time. I could have bought it. And I told her, okay, as we are, let's, let's, let's go and discuss. So as we were driving back with my partner, my partner also fed into my dysfunction. And she said, hey, look at that place. It's far. I said, yeah, it's far. I thought I was the only one who noticed it. Well, it's very far. I don't think we can go there. I said, yeah, 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 no. no hey, let's just go and think about it, whatever. So we are discussing. And, and you know, we are poking holes in the idea, poking holes, poking holes. By the time we arrived home, we had already made a decision. Nah. Then one day. One day, I'm driving, going to that area. I think I was, I was meeting somebody somewhere. I think it is, I was coming to your home or whatever. Yes, I was coming to Pastor Say's home. And we drove and we went towards that direction. And I was driving. I'm like, Pastor May, are you seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> and she says, yes. The place that I saw that didn't have potential was full of houses. People have built nice houses. I even went to where that lady took us. I could not even see the plot. The whole area had been built. I pinched myself. So I don't like going that direction. <laughs> when Pastor Seth invites me to his house, it's a very challenging trip to make. Because every time I just join that road, I remember. So that's what knowledge can do. You go to an area, there is nothing. But it gives you extraordinary instincts. Telling you, take it. Telling you, buy it. Telling you, sacrifice and just have it. And then in future, you come to that place and you celebrate. May you never be like me. May you have extraordinary instincts. May you see places of potential in the name of Jesus. Can I hear louder amen in this house? Number two, what did he do? He maintained pace. Isaac maintained pace because of knowledge. He maintained pace because of knowledge. His success attracted opposition. You see, when you're successful, you'll be fought. And so as he was digging these wells and water is flowing, all of a sudden, he attracted opposition. The locals threatened his pace and momentum in life. They were jealous of his success. That's why every well that was functioning, they possessed it. They told him, now this well is ours. Now this well is ours. Now this well is ours. Genesis 26, verse 20 to 22, the Bible says, The husband of Gerard quarreled with Isaac's husband, saying, The water is ours. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. He kept on moving until he got to a place where they could not quarrel with him. He maintained pace. He kept on going. The way I've kept on going, I missed that opportunity, but others I have been able to grab them. He kept on going, and you have to keep on going. Maintain pace. It is knowledge that will make you maintain pace because you will not repeat the same mistake again. Because of knowledge, no amount of opposition dampened, dampened his determination to succeed. That's why he kept on digging well after well after well after well. And his servants also caught the bug of redigging wells. And they also started digging well after well after well. The people took over the wells that he had dug, but because of his determination and the knowledge that he had, he kept on moving to strategic spots and he kept on digging more wells so that he may be able to survive. Say this with me. Ignorance is a momentum killer. Shout it louder. Ignorance is 
You see, when you are ignorant and they shut down one well, you think your life is over. When you're ignorant and your efforts are frustrated, you think it is over because you believe that that was the, um, that was the lucky break that you are waiting for in your life. And so you give up, you become discouraged, you know, and you think that now your life is over. But when you have knowledge, vast knowledge, no matter what people take away from you, no matter the opposition you face, you will keep on going. Can I hear an amen in this house? People can take your car, but you'll buy another car because of what you know. People will suck you from the job, but you will get another job because of what you know. People will con you monies, but you will still make money because of what you know. Somebody will break your heart. Hey! Break it into pieces. Until even you, you wonder if you're still having your heart with you. But because of what you know, you will heal and you will fall in love again and you will get married. Am I preaching to somebody in this house? So look at your neighbor and tell them, don't allow any opposition to kill your momentum. Oh yes, no matter what happens, you keep going. But what will keep you going is the knowledge you have acquired. The more you know, the better it is for you. You will keep going, you will keep going, you will keep going. They stop this well, you dig another one. They possess this well, you dig another one. Because of knowledge, no amount of opposition will be able to kill your momentum. Until your enemy is surprised. I mean, we have taken everything from this guy, but this guy is still moving. This guy is still breathing. This guy, he keeps on moving. I remember one time I was watching these animals, the National Geographic uh, channel and I was watching a lion had grabbed a buffalo and the lion tried to kill the buffalo but the buffalo had a fight in it and so the lion was trying to choke the buffalo the buffalo refused to be choked another lion came grabbed the buffalo ate the entire tail cut it off but the buffalo kept on fighting and fighting and fighting until the lion got tired and the lion just moved behind and looked at the buffalo. The buffalo was tired, a lot of injuries, with a lot of injuries, but it was still alive. And you could see that the lion was confused. It had tried everything on that buffalo. Tried to choke the buffalo, but the buffalo was still there, breathing. The buffalo was still there, and the lion was confused. It left the buffalo. That's what you should become. When you have knowledge, nothing can put you down. Who am I preaching to in this house? When you have knowledge, no opposition can stop you. When you have knowledge, no amount of obstacles can be able to hinder you from moving forward. They take this, you keep on going. They try to sabotage this project, you keep on going. They try to discourage you in one way or another, but you keep on going. I'm preaching to people because of knowledge. Nothing will put them down in the name of Jesus. No demon will put you down. No devil will put you down. No opposition will put you down. No circumstance, whatever it is, will put you down in the name of Jesus. Because of what you know, you will keep on going forward. Because of the knowledge you have acquired, you will keep on moving forward. Shout amen if you believe in this world. Mm. Number three. We are still talking about Isaac. He handled disputes wisely. Because of knowledge. He handled disputes wisely. The herdsmen of Gerald, Gerald quarreled with his herdsmen. They were fighting. They were having some exchanges. But we don't see Isaac getting involved. He didn't get involved. He didn't even try to fight back. He didn't even try to go there and tell, oh, we are the one, tell them, oh, we, you, we are the ones who dug this well. We are the ones who discovered the well. He didn't even do that. He didn't engage himself in that kind of battle. Because of the knowledge he had, he refused completely to be drawn into unnecessary quarrels at Isaac, as well as Sidna. Why did he do that? He realized that these disputes were useless, energy-sapping controversies that were a distraction to him. 
He refused, ladies and gentlemen, to engage in petty fights. Servants are fighting. He's a big man. He's a blessed man. He's a knowledgeable man. He didn't want to be involved in those petty fights. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. Sometimes, walking away from some, some battles is actually winning. Only three can clap. Sometimes, walking away from some battles is actually winning. Why is it winning? Because some battles are unnecessary. Some fights are unnecessary. Some battles are not for your level. Some fights are not for your level. You have a bigger giant to slay. You have a bigger problem to deal with, and so you can't get involved in petty fights, petty fights and petty battles until they drain you. By the time you have to deal with the major thing, your energy is expended. Sometimes walking away from some battles is actually winning. And you must now come to a place where you choose your battles. The reason why some of us are not excelling is because we are fighting in every battle. Even battles that are not ours, we want to fight. Everywhere you see people want to fight, you also clench your fist. You throw yourself in the ring. You say, I also want to fight. Caretakers are fighting in the estate. You also join in. Somebody is fighting with his wife. You also join in. And because you're foolish, you go to defend the wife. <laughs> One day, I had Pastor Mary's phone ringing. It was middle in the night, in the middle of the night. And I was surprised, who is this that is calling at this particular moment? It's disturbing us. So it was one of the neighbors who was calling and telling her, please tell pastor and you to come to my house now. Hey. Now. Pastor and I to come to your house now. It was almost, I think, midnight going to one. Me. Even if they wake me up, I will not go. Because <laughs> you don't know where it started from. People are fighting in their bedroom. You wake up and go. You will lose your teeth. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm talking about? You should not be involved in every fight. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I mean, let me talk to parents here. Don't be involved in every fight that you see in your children. That your, your, your son has gone to the, to, the, to the barber shop, he's come back with a mohawk. Now it's an issue. You are calling for a family meeting because of a mohawk. Family meeting and you're sitting and you're talking and you're mad and you're angry. There are things you should not even fight about. Your daughter just applied lipstick. You have called for a crisis meeting. Your husband is in Brazil. You put your husband on Zoom to discuss your daughter's lipstick. There are battles you should not engage yourself in. With your children, there are serious battles. Lipstick is nothing. Mohawk is nothing. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Be concerned when you find your son in his bedroom with another girl. Now, that's a serious battle. But Mohawk. Mohawk. That's nothing. You understand what I'm talking about? Or he's sagging. That's nothing. So once in a while, you just pull the drawers up and you tell him, boss, I'm seeing your inner paraphernalia. You just pull it up a bit. Choose your battles. Tell your neighbor, choose your battles. Don't fight in everything. Some of us, we are fighting everything. You are always fighting. You are always fighting. So when important battles come, you have no energy to fight. 
Isaac, they could tell him, oh, your servants and the servants of Gerar are fighting. He said, no problem. Let's move to another place. Oh, they want this? Well, no problem. Leave it to them. Let's move to another place. You must choose your battles. You can't fight all the time. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You can't be clenching your fist all the time. You are fighting at home. You are fighting in the office. You are fighting in the matatu. You are fighting on the road. You are fighting in the bedroom. You are fighting in the sitting room. You are fighting in the kitchen. You are fighting with the watchman. You are fighting with everybody. You are just on a war mood. When the real battle comes, you have no energy to fight. Isaac had energy to dig wells, but zero energy to engage in useless fights. Because for him, digging the well was more important than resolving the dispute between the war, between the, uh, the servants who were fighting the servants of Gerar. For him, digging the wall, digging the wells rather, was the most important thing. Not engaging at oh, all. So what did he say? This one abused you. Oh, he abused you. Where? Well, say sorry. Sorry. Okay, so we are good. All right, let's go back. He didn't want to do that. And you must choose your battles as well. That's why knowledge is important. You understand what I'm talking about? Knowledge is very, very important. Praise the Lord. One time I was doing a counseling session for another couple. And if you hear the things that keep them awake at night to discuss, you are surprised. <laughs> the husband sent the wife to go and buy bread and milk at the shop. So at the shop, there was some change of about five shillings. So the wife bought a chewing gum. When she came back, the husband said, okay, so you, I gave you this amount of money. So milk is this much and bread is this much. So where is the five shillings balance? You bought chewing gum. We need to talk. They sleep at 2 a.m. Because of a chewing gum. Really? Are you serious? Five shillings, you sleep at 2 a.m.? Tell me about choose your battles. Tell them again, choose your battles. Touch again and tell them, choose your battles. And because Isaac chose his battles, look at what happened. He walked away from these unnecessary battles. Verse 26 to 29. Uh, Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuza, one of his friends, and Fico, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hurt me and have sent me away from you? But they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. Wow. So we say, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. You see, he said, we have not touched you, but you see, the thing is, it is Isaac who refused confrontation. It was not Abimelech. It is Isaac who refused con confrontation. He decided to walk away. Sometimes when you are walking away, you are actually winning. Oh, yes. Oh. As you are walking away, you are actually winning. And the person that wanted to provoke you later on will come looking for you. Because they will see, as you are walking away, God is blessing you. As you are walking away, away, God is lifting you. As you are walking away, God is favoring you. And then they will realize, hey, it was even dangerous to try and fight Somebody that was already blessed of the Lord. So tell you, but stop fighting all the time. Sometimes you have to kiss that enemy of yours goodbye. Adios amigos. I don't want to fight with you. We have fought all these years. 
You know, we have quarreled these years, but I don't want to fight with you anymore. I'm walking away. Have whatever you want to have. Because, you see, the blessing was not in the well. The blessing was in Isaac. Oh, Lord, help me preach in this house. It, it, it was not in the well. The knowledge that he had of God ensured that he was a carrier of the blessing. So if the car is bringing tension between us, you can have the car. If it is the job that is bringing tension between us, you can have the job. If it's this little money that is bringing tension between us, you can have it. Because I want you to know I'm a carrier of blessings. I will still have a car. I will still get a house. I will still get another job. I will still make money. Sometimes walking away is actually winning. Not winning, winning. Nehemiah chapter 6, the last scripture. <laughs> oh, yes. Touch your neighbor, tell them, choose your battles. Hallelujah. For me, as a principle, I don't engage in battles I know I'm going to lose. When I sense there is defeat, I withdraw. Yeah, because I have my own pride to keep. How will I go home and explain to my children that I went to war and I was defeated? It cannot happen in the name of Jesus. You know, I play, I play golf with several people. Last week when I was playing golf with Pastor C, he looked at me and said, Hey, Pastor, you're very competitive. I said, Oh, yeah. Because when I reach home, Pastor Mary will ask me who won. <laughs> what will I tell her? I cannot tell her I lost. So I must defeat you. So when I get home and she asks you, So who won? I say, Oh, of course. Can you imagine your husband coming home and he's telling you, oh, I was beaten, I was defeated. You will not feel nice. When we were in America this last time, we were two teams, Kenyan team and American team, and we were playing, we were playing pool, pool table. I'm telling you the competition that was there was serious. The wives were celebrating their husbands. And the husbands were celebrating their wives. It's a team we defeated. They were not very happy. They asked for a rematch. And in that rematch, we lost. So I asked for a rematch. They say, no, 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 no. There is no rematch because let's, let it stay like that. You won the first time. We won the second time. So we are equal. Yeah. Don't engage in every fight. Nehemiah chapter 6. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our armies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no bricks left in it. So at that time, I had not hung the doors in the gate. Verse 2. That Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Now look at verse 3. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work. Tell your neighbor you're doing a great work. And so he says, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? While I leave it and go down to you. What was Nehemiah saying? I cannot engage in that useless fight that you want to draw me into. I am doing a great work. I have something major that I'm doing. I am building the walls of Jerusalem. And sometimes when you discover your main thing, then it helps you to select your battles. Eesh. When you discover the thing that you're meant to do, the assignment that God has designed for you to accomplish, it will help you to select the battles that you're supposed to engage in. I pray for you today that because of knowledge, you will not engage in every battle. You will choose your battles. You will be a wise mother. You will be a wise father. You will be a wise leader. You will choose your battles in the name of Jesus. Can somebody shout amen in this house? Clap your hands and celebrate Jesus. I have to stop here. Stand to your feet. I was meant to give you two points, but I'm out of time. So we'll continue this coming Sunday. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Help us to choose our battles. May your knowledge help us. 
to determine what to engage in and not what to engage in. Strengthen us by your might. Give us wisdom and strength that we may choose the right battles to engage in in the name of Jesus. Guide us and be with us. Before I finish this prayer, if you're here not born again, lift up your hand and I will lead you to Christ. You're not born again. You're not saved. You're saying, Pastor, pray for me. I need to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Are you there? You're here. Shoot your hand up. I'll see it. Are you there? Father, we thank you for your word. May your word help us to focus on the main thing and to choose our battles. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Celebrate Jesus one more time. Amen.